So let's move on to our next topic. Next topic is going to revolve around service equipment. Uh, Chad, can you talk to us about changes around uh, the NAC and service equipment? And I know there's some stuff that's around line side barriers and disconnects. Yeah, Phil, there's a, there's a lot to talk about here when it comes to service equipment and changes in the 2020 NEC. You know, we'll start with line side barriers in 230.62C. We had a requirement in the 2017 NEC that really expanded historically from switchboards and switchgear to include panel boards. But if we think about it, there are a lot of other commercial products, industrial products that have suitable for use of service equipment ratings and can be used in that application, so why not extend the protection to those? So that's what you're gonna see here in this section, line side barriers on the utility side. So to provide inadvertent contact from service equipment, line side terminals and bus, uh, as viewed from load terminations and when you're servicing those load terminations. So products such as motor control centers, safety switches, transfer switches, uh, that you might not have been covered in the 2017 NEC for line side barriers are now gonna have this equivalent protection. And I, again, I think that it is a piece of the, the protection that electrical workers need, but it's not the whole thing. So Jim, you may wanna speak to that. Absolutely, this is, uh, this is huge for worker safety. And you know, when we are in service equipment, we, we know that the line side, there is no clearing time there. So you know, we could take a look at available fault current, but if we're, tooken, if we're taking a look at potential arc flash energy, we can't calculate it and we can't use the arc flash PPE tables. But keep in mind that now all service equipment, without regard to what it is, it's not limited, as Chad pointed out, to switch gear, switch boards, and panel boards. If it's service supplied, it's going to have to have uh, protection from inadvertent contact. And keep in mind that this protection from inadvertent contact does not eliminate the possibility, but what it does is it significantly reduces the likelihood of an occurrence. And that's a big win for worker safety. Absolutely. So moving on, when we start talking about the number of service disconnects, Jim, you may want to speak to how that's changing. Yeah, there's, there's big revisions in 230.71. 230.71 is, is now titled uh, maximum number, uh, well, 230.71 is maximum number of disconnects, but 230.71B gets us in to two to six service disconnects. So the general rule is you're going to be permitted to have uh, six service disconnects, but working our way down into the permitted methods, there is going to be uh, uh, four different ways that you can get that done. So, for example, the first would be service equipment, and that, that's very broad. So, you know, service equipment could include a panel board, it could include uh, a, a service rated transfer switch, etc. but it's separate enclosures with a main service disconnecting means in each enclosure. The next is panel boards, and this is a big one, all right? You can have uh, six service disconnecting means, and you can put them in panel boards, but each panel board is limited to one service disconnect. Next, we have switch boards, and you can have more than one in a switch board, provided that they're installed in vertical sections, and we have separation barriers provided between those sections. Now, switch gear and metering centers, you're going to be permitted to have up to six, but keep in mind, you know, here we're talking about compartmentalization. So when we get into switch gears and metering centers, you know, Chad, do you want to comment on how we could get that, that compartmentalization? Yeah, no, thank you, Jim. So switch gear by definition is, uh, is compartmentalized where you have a circuit breaker compartment, you have a busing compartment, and you have rear termination compartments. So that in and of itself provides metal compartmentalization between breakers and between bus and terminations. So when you're servicing terminations there, you're not exposed to line side bus. The same is gonna be changed with meter compartments. So metering compartments historically have had compartments for each of the meter sockets. Now you're gonna see compartmentalization of each service disconnect in its own separate compartment uh, where just that compartment can be opened and, um, and entered from external, whether that's a door or a cover. So these are big changes. I think one another big area to think about here, Jim, is also the large commercial panel board piece where you might've had a 1200 amp main lug panel board and, four, and two to six main breakers here. Uh, the game sort of changes here and important for safety. 
Yeah, these are, these are all safety-driven changes in the National Electrical Code that are designed to provide an additional level of protection for installer maintainers that are there after the initial installation. And Mike is going to take us into some of the requirements for large equipment working spaces and some of the changes that occurred there in 110.26. Yeah, thanks, Jim. The uh... 11026 in general is all about working space and and uh, providing minimum requirements for working space uh, for uh, access to and egress from when you're dealing with larger equipment and that's what we're talking about there's changes that happen in 11026 C dealing with uh, large equipment that deal with the um, the panic hardware the listed fire rated hardware that must be used when the door has to swing uh, away from the equipment or in the direction of egress. Those are new requirements that you'll see in the 2020 NEC. But there's also a method now to establish when uh, a, a method of egress or entrance is required at each end of the workspace. Uh, typically with large equipment, that threshold is uh, at the 1200 amp uh, or greater level and uh, the equipment is uh, six feet in width or greater. Uh, that triggers the uh, requirement for access and egress to the workspace in front of that equipment. Well, when you have equipment now that uh, may be used in the service position or service disconnects, uh, you may have multiple pieces of equipment in that space that present the same hazard. So the code addresses this and says that where you have multiple disconnects, uh, as you might have in accordance with 23071, as you add the sums of the ratings of those disconnects, when they get to the 1200 amp threshold, that's going to trigger the requirement for access and egress from the workspace in uh, where those uh, the grouping occurs for those disconnects meeting the 23071 requirement. And there's one other uh, change that I wanted to talk about uh, in 11026C that deals with doors on equipment. And when the doors are opened in a 90 degree position, if there's an obstruction such as a wall or another piece of equipment, in directly in front of the piece of equipment where the door opens, the possibility of entrapping a worker in there, boxing a worker in, is, uh, is increased dramatically. The code now addresses uh, that in this section. It's just a one sentence ad, but as Jim indicated, this is all about uh, safety driven requirements, uh, adequate workspace, and uh, the means to get away from equipment if something were to fail. So Jim, let me ask you a question on why we're on this multiple service disconnects. Let's say I have three 400 amp service disconnects along a wall. How would I determine that six, that six foot measurement? It's a, it's a good question, Chad. If you go back in the process and look at this language during the first revision, it just said if you had, if you applied more than one service disconnect, then you would have to add up the sum of those ratings. So if I had three 400s, I would get to 1200. And the reason for that is that this rule is all about allowing us to get out of a room if there is an arc flash incident. And the energy is the same. It, I don't need a single piece of equipment rated at 1200 amps six feet wide. If I've got service conductors coming in that have the capability of supplying the same available fault current to multiple disconnects, then you know I have to get this done. Chad's question is a good one. Do I measure those three 400 amp disconnects and, and add that up to see if I get to six feet? Or do I go from the outside of this one to the outside of the third one? I think that that's the way you would have to do it. But this may need a little bit of work in the future because think about it. I could have two of those 400 amp disconnects on one side of the room mm -hmm. and another one mm. on the other side of the room. So that will present some challenges. So in those cases, I would highly suggest that you work with the authority having jurisdiction uh, during the rough end stage to see what's going to be required. And one more piece here is in 110.26 where we uh, require listed panic hardware, you can also have listed fire exit hardware. And Mike might want to speak to that just a little bit. Sure, thanks, Jim. Yeah, and, and 
the additional wording is uh, listed fire exit hardware uh, in addition to listed panic hardware and those two could be one and the same depending on your configuration. Many electric rooms uh, have a fire rating envelope around them and uh, another point to be made here is we're talking about large equipment in 11026C but uh, listed panic hardware and listed fire exit hardware are also addressed for equipment over a thousand volts up in, I believe, section 11034, you'll see a similar change. And if we, we recall, right, I mean, the importance of that is, is when that went in, we saw unfortunate burns uh, from an event and, and ultimately being able to back out of those rooms, that panic hardware is extremely important if an event's to happen to be able to back out of there fast and get out of the room. So. Yeah. That door has to open in the direction of egress, and we need that panic hardware. Uh, if you get a chance to see arc flash explosions, you, the, the videos are readily available. Uh, everybody has seen them. Just imagine all of those gases in a small electrical room. And, you know, you need to get out. You've got superheated, toxic gas. You need to get out of the room, and that's the reason for panic hardware and doors that open in the direction of egress. And what's also new in that section is an informational note that points to two UL or two product standards that uh, relate to the listed panic hardware and the listed fire exit hardware. The listed panic hardware may not carry the fire rating, but the listed fire exit hardware carries both. It carries the panic feature plus a fire rating with it. So the informational note's important there. It points you to the product standard related to those types of equipment.